All right, welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. I believe this is episode 26. We are reading Race Matters by Cornell West. We're on chapter five, Beyond Affirmative Action. All right. Institutionalized rejection of difference is an absolute necessity in a profit economy which needs outsiders as surplus people. As members of such an economy, we have all been programmed to respond to the human differences between us with fear and loathing and to handle that difference in one of three ways. Ignore it, and if that is not possible, copy it if we think it is dominant or destroy it if we think it is subordinate. But we have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals. As a result, those differences have been misnamed and misused in the service of separation and confusion. Audre Lorde, Sister Outsider, 1984. <clears throat> the fundamental crisis in black America is twofold. Too much poverty and too little self-love. The urgent problem of black poverty is primarily due to the distribution of wealth, power, and income. A distribution influenced by the racial caste system that denied opportunities to most, quote, qualified, end quote, black people until two decades ago. The historic role of American progressives is to promote redistributive measures that enhance the standard of living and quality of life for the have-nots and have-too-littles. Affirmative action was one such redistributive measure that surfaced in the heat of battle in the 1960s among those fighting for racial equality. Like earlier de facto affirmative action measures in the American past, Contracts, jobs, and loans to select immigrants granted by political machines, subsidies to certain farmers, FHA mortgage loans to specific buyers, or GI Bill benefits to particular courageous Americans, recent efforts to broaden access to America's prosperity have been based upon preferential policies. <clears throat> Unfortunately, these policies have always benefit middle Unfortunately, these policies always benefit middle class Americans disproportionately. The political power of big business and big government circumscribes redistributive measures and thereby tilts these measures away from the have nots and have too littles. Early redistributive measure, every redistributive measure is a compromise with and concession from the caretakers of American prosperity, that is, big business and big government. Affirmative, affirmative action was one such compromise and concession to cheat. My fault. Hold on, I'm turning the page. It's always difficult when I turn the page. So anytime it's a pause, a lot of times because I'm turning the page. My fault. All right. I know it's hard to explain that, but my hand's full. It's windy. And so it's like affirmative action was one such compromise and concession achieved after the protracted struggle of American progressives and liberals in the courts and in the streets. Visionary progressives always push for substantive redistributive measures that make opportunities available to the have-nots and have-too-littles, such as more federal support to small farmers or more FHA mortgage loans to urban dwellers as well as suburban home buyers. Yet in the American political system, where the powers that be turn a skeptical eye toward any program aimed at economic redistribution, progressives must secure whatever redistributive measures they can, ensure their enforcement, then extend their benefits if possible. If I had been old enough to join the fight for racial equality in the courts, the legislatures, and the boardrooms in the 1960s, I was old enough to be in the streets. I would have favored, as I do now, a class-based affirmative action in principle. Yet in the heat of battle in American politics, a redistributive measure in principle with no power and pressure behind it means no redistributive measure at all. The prevailing discriminatory practices during the 60s, whose targets were working people, women, and people of color, were atrocious. Thus, an enforceable race-based and later gender-based affirmative action policy was the best possible compromise and concession. Progressives should view affirmative action as neither a major solution to poverty nor a sufficient means to equality. We should see it as primarily playing a negative role, namely, to ensure that discriminatory practices against women and people of color are abated. Given the history of this country, it is a virtual certainty that without affirmative action, racial and sexual discrimination will return with a vengeance. 
even if affirmative action fails significantly to reduce black poverty or contributes to the persistence of racist perceptions in a workplace, without affirmative action, black access to America's prosperity would be even more difficult to obtain and racism in a workplace would persist anyway. What up, what up? This claim is not based on any cynicism toward my white fellow citizens. Rather, it rests upon America's historically weak will toward racial justice and substantive redistributive measures. This is why an attack on affirmative action is an attack on redistributive efforts by progressives, unless there is a real possibility of enacting and enforcing a more wide-reaching class-based affirmative action policy. In American politics, progressives must not only cling to redistributive ideals, but must also fight for those policies that, out of compromise and concession, and perfectly conform to those ideals. Liberals who give only lip service to these ideals trash the policies in the name of real politic or reject the policies as they perceive a shift in the racial bellwether give up precious ground too easily. And they do so even as the sand is disappearing under our feet on such issues as regressive taxation, layoffs, or take backs from workers and cutbacks in health and child care. Affirmative action is not the most important issue for black progress in America, but it is a part of redistributive chain, but it is a part of a redistributive chain that must be strengthened if we are to confront and eliminate black poverty. If there were social democratic redistributive measures that wiped out black poverty and if racial and sexual discrimination could be abated through the goodwill and and, and merit meridius merit it's not too often I run across a word I can't pronounce or at least try to pronounce. Uh, let me go back. Okay. If there were social democratic redistributive measures that wiped out black poverty and if racial and sexual discrimination could be abated through the goodwill and meritorious judgments of those in power, affirmative action would be unnecessary. Although many liberal and progressive citizens view affirmative action as a redistributive measure whose time is over or whose life is no longer worth preserving, I question their view because of the persistence, because of the persistent persistence of discriminatory practices that increase black social misery and the warranted suspicion that goodwill and fair judgment among the powerful does not loom as large toward women and people of color. Okay, and then that that brings us to uh, a stopping point, and then Cornell West begins in the same chapter with, uh, I'm guessing a new some a new overall theme. Uh, but what I want to touch on is, mm, where is it at? Uh, he spoke about how these affirmative action and was something that primarily uh, benefited middle class citizens. Uh, I wanna, I wanna find that. Okay. Like earlier de facto affirmative action measures in the American past, recent efforts to broaden access to America's prosperity have been based upon preferential policies. Unfortunately, these policies always benefit middle class Americans disproportionately. And I think that that's something that we have to keep a, a, a mindful or, or put a concerted effort towards keeping at the forefront of the consciousness of people when uh, they point to bills that have been passed in the past or, man, who dog is this? Uh, my fault. Uh, we outside. I think we have to be mindful of this when we think about things that uh, bills or that have passed in the past or when we think about uh, hearing uh, political uh, mouthpieces or politicians speak about things that they have done in office or things that they got passed in office or uh, how many more jobs it was or how many more people uh, were uh, graduating college or high school that are black is remembering that this these things are always and primarily geared towards uh, people that have already, in some aspect, overcame the damages of, of poverty. Uh, 
these are things, and this is something that Malcolm X would speak about heavily during the uh, 60s when the civil rights movement was going on, is that the things that were being struggled for and that were being gained, that they were disproportionately being gained by black people who were uh, middle class and uh, part of the uh, bourgeoisie and who already had, uh, d in some manner, defeated a specific part of the uh, negative connotations that come with being black in America and part of that is is poverty and uh, all the things that come along with poverty and so I think that that's something that we have to be have a concerted effort when we're speaking in the future about dealing with racial injustice is that it's not simply just dealing with racial injustice for people who uh, have access to mainstream America and are being denied it because of their skin color it's about getting racial justice or d struggling against racial injustice for the black people who deal with the who are on the margins of uh, the society as a, as, a, as a whole and are on the margins of society both because of their skin color but also because of uh, them being in poverty and because of the communities they come from because of the type of generational uh, issues that they have dealt with uh, and, and, and so that's one of the main things that I take out of that is uh, too often some of these things that have been deemed progressive bills or uh, affirmative action or, or steps forward for black America have been steps forward for a specific portion of black America, have been steps forward for the black America who is already uh, part of the mainstream American society. Uh, in a way, in one way or another. <clears throat> if the elimination of black poverty is a necessary condition of substantive black progress, then the, affirm then the affirmation of black humanity, especially among black people themselves, is a sufficient condition of such progress. Such affirmation speaks to the existential issues of what it means to be a degraded African, man, woman, gay, lesbian, child, in a racist society. How does one affirm oneself without reenacting negative black stereotypes or overreacting to white supremacist ideals? The difficult and delicate quest for black identity is integral to any talk about racial equality. Yet it is not solely a political or economic matter. The quest for black identity involves self-respect and self-regard, realms inseparable from, yet not identical to, political power and economic status. The flagrant self-loathing among black middle class professional bears, bears witness to this painful process. Unfortunately, black conservatives focus on the issue of self-respect as if it were the one key that would open all doors to black progress. They illustrate the fallacy of trying to open all doors with one key. They wind up closing their eyes to all doors except the one key. Damn, I fucked that sentence up. That was a good sentence. Let me try that again. They illustrate the fallacy of trying to open all doors with one key. They wind up closing their eyes to all doors except the one the key fits. Progressives, for our part, must take seriously the quest for self-respect even as we train our eye on the institutional causes of black social misery. The issues of black identity... Both black self-love and self-content sit alongside each other. Sit alongside. What up, what up, what up, bro? What up? What up, what up? You already know. Keep it in prison. How you feeling? Man, I bet. I'm going to be here. It's good seeing you. Uh, my fault, y'all. We outside. We outside. Uh, okay. Progressives, for our part, must take seriously the quest for self-respect even as we train our eye on the institutional causes of black social misery. The issues of black identity, both black self-love and self-contempt, sit alongside black poverty as realities to confront and transform. The uncritical acceptance of self-degrading ideals that call into question black intelligence, possibility, and beauty not only compounds black social misery, but also paralyzes black middle class efforts to defend broad redistributive measures. This paralysis takes two forms. Black bourgeois preoccupation with white peer approval 
and black nationalist obsession with white racism. The first form of paralysis tends to yield a navel-gazing posture that conflates the identity crisis of the black middle class with the state of siege raging in black working poor and very poor communities. That, that unidimensional view obscures the need for redistributive measures that significantly affect the majority of blacks who are working people on the edge of poverty. The second form of paralysis precludes any meaningful coalition with white progressives because of an undeniable white racist legacy of the modern Western world. The anger this truth engenders impedes any effective way of responding to the crisis in black America. Broad redistributive measures require principal coalitions, including multiracial alliances. Without such measures, black America's sufferings deepen. White racism indeed contributes to this suffering. Yet an obsession with white racism often comes at the expense of more broadly based alliances to affect social change and borders on a tribal mentality. The more xenophobic versions of this viewpoint simply mirror the white supremacist ideals we are opposing and preclude any movement toward redistributive goals. Man, this win. I hope this win ain't messing the mic up too much. All right, my fault, y'all. How one defines oneself influences what analytical weight one gives to black poverty. Any progressive discussion about the future of racial equality must speak to black poverty and black identity. My views on the necessity and limits of affirmative action in the present moment are informed by how substantive redistributive measures and human aff affirmative efforts can be best defended and expanded. And that is the end of Beyond Affirmative Action. Uh, speaking on the, yeah, I'm gonna move this cord. I feel like this is <clears throat> speak. I want to speak on the, on the, the second half of that chapter. That chapter was basically split into two halves. And on the second half, uh, second half, Cornell West does what he's been doing throughout this book, and that is adds a uh, cultural element or speaks on a community element uh, or a philosophical element that he has attached to the uh, political element that he's touching on. And so just as he did when speaking about uh, black conservatives, just as he did when speaking about black liberals, just as he did when uh, and in each chapter, he's taking the time to not only talk about the political implications, uh, the type of policy changes that are necessary, uh, but also speaking about the type of uh, the societal implications of things, the uh, community implications of things, the cultural implications of things. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things that is very necessary uh, for for this the dialogue that we need to have is to have it at, on a full spectrum and not to have it uh, isolated. I think that's something that's important about informing people about these issues, informing people about uh, police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice is not only speaking about it from the standpoint of the uh, of policies or the standpoints of laws, uh, but also speaking on it on the standpoint of what it does to uh, to homes, what it does to neighborhoods, what it does to uh, people's psyches, and what it does to uh, uh, people's uh, emotions. And those are all things that are just as important. I think that that is when you start to really understand the gravity that all of these things have is when you can see them on a, a full human scope, a few, full human level and not just on a systematic level. I think that that's the number one thing that I pull away from uh, so far from going through and reading Race Matters again is the human element that Cornell West adds in there. And of course, some of the some of that human element he adds in there is his opinion and it is his philosophy and is his beliefs uh, as he's sort of attaching that to things that are more uh, concrete you know uh, uh statistical facts uh, but i think that that is what we need we uh you know i think that it's important and he's done that well in here i believe is separating statistical facts from philosophy uh and in that chapter it was done i think probably one of the in the best ways because it was a shorter chapter uh i also take from this i have because i have a few pieces highlighted in here i want to read this sentence one time Unfortunately, black conservatives focus on the issue of self-respect as if it were the one key that would open all doors to black progress. They illustrate the fallacy of trying to open all doors with one key. 
they wind up closing their eyes to all doors except the one the key fits. And uh, I think that that's one of the uh, things that's most important about uh, what up, what up, what up, um, I think that's one of the things that's most important uh, about that chapter uh, as well, as it points out the dangers of having a, a mentality or ideology that's uh, centered on absoluteness, that's centered on uh, your way or the highway, you know, because it gets you into a place where you uh, can't see the other uh the options that you have at your uh, that you have at your access that could uh, help you to defeat some of these things. I think that that's one of the things that's important about uh, us moving forward here is that we have to be able to build these inroads and build bridges with uh, people who have dealt with some of these negatives from different spectrums of the society, from different uh, areas of the community. Uh, to and I don't think that adding more people who have dealt with these things from different. Uh, from different communities or from different perspectives uh, dilutes uh, the black perspective or dilutes the uh, your perspective if you're not black and if you're uh, Hispanic or Middle Eastern or a, a woman I don't think you get diluted from adding these other uh, experiences into your uh, uh, into your struggle or into your uh, organization or to whatever it is that you're uh, creating I think that it empowers you I think that when you can understand that no specific struggle or no specific oppression or exploitation uh, is more important but they all have their own uh, histories they all have their own legacies and you have to remember which histories and legacies uh, have existed you know uh, and in which manners that they have existed uh, but that's that's just you know history and understanding of history and when you have that understanding of history then you can have black poor people working aside white poor people working aside uh uh uh, uh second generation uh uh, Hispanic poor people and none of them in indigenous people with none of these groups or classes feeling as if uh, they are taking away from what their specific struggle is uh, as they work towards trying to get to, uh, you know, equity and equality in a society. And so uh, that's going to bring us to the end of chapter five. We're going to get ready and start. We'll start chapter six on the next episode. Uh, we kept this one down between 30 minutes. That's because the chapters were shorter. So that worked out perfect. Uh, share this on whatever platform that you're listening to it on. Uh, we're re again reading Race Matters by Cornell West. Uh, be on the lookout for the next episode of Rafa Reading Daily uh, coming out tomorrow. All right, we outside.